Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us. You can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org where we have these great interviews. The, the full form interviews are there as well as power clips from those interviews. And we hope you'll enjoy it. We, we are also on all the social media platforms and we're really here uh, to talk about the good stuff, to inspire and encourage and empower. And uh, we have a wonderful guest with us today. Uh, Terrence Lester is with us. Terrence is the founder of Love Beyond Walls. Uh, he's in Atlanta, Georgia. Terrence, welcome. Hey, Dean. Uh, it's great to be here. How's it going? We're good. We're great. I, I have so enjoyed over the last couple of days uh, reading about you and reading about your story. But and I want to get to a lot. But but start with kind of just you your your upbringing. Yeah, are you from Atlanta or where'd you grow up? Yeah, I'm actually uh, a native of Atlanta, Georgia. I've been here my entire life, which is very rare because Atlanta is known for its transplants. Um, people are here from all over claiming Atlanta as home. And so, yeah, I've been here my entire life. And now you had an experience when you were 16 that I was reading about that were, and I, I mean, uh, it, it sounded to me like you were essentially homeless or, or kind of moving around what what happened to you when you were 16 yeah sure uh when i was 16 years old uh, i left home ran away from home and um i had a, a window where i was like literally sleeping from park to park and from friend's house to friend's house and just really trying to figure out um uh, my identity uh trying to make sense of uh, my, my social context um, related to my family. And I had a friend whose father came into my life early on. Uh, his name was Mr. Moore. And Mr. Moore became a mentor to me. And he would uh, call out the good things in me. Um, he would uh, talk to me about my future. And he would encourage me to think larger than the context that I had grown up in. And so a huge uh, shout out to Mr. Moore, who is who has passed away. He passed away the first year I started uh, Love Beyond Walls, but he was a guy that I could reach out to and ask, you know, should I marry her? Should I put myself through college? Uh, should I think about uh, pursuing uh, nonprofit work? Uh, he became a, a staple in my life, and I was able to overcome a lot of those challenges. Wow. Everybody needs a Mr. Moore, don't we? <laughs> that, that's yeah. uh, mentoring is such a powerful thing. Yeah, I mean, mentorship affords uh, those who are being mentored the opportunity to uh, get insights, um, to uh, have space where there can be a level or this sense of vulnerability. Um, mentorship al also provides uh, wisdom. Uh, my stepfather says that knowledge is information, but wisdom is application, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mentorship uh, provides this, this great sense of wisdom, but it also uh, helps the person who is being mentored find clarity um, because the mentee is able to ask all sorts of questions, uh, whether those questions are related to uh, the mentor's work, uh, specifically if the mentee has desires to do the same type of work that the mentor is doing, uh, but greater than that, just questions about life. You know, there are tons of things that can be gleaned from sitting with uh, persons who are vulnerable enough to share their existential experiences, uh, where by which Mr. Moore was one of those individuals. I mean, we have so many stories that we could relate to each other uh, with, but greater than that, he was able to mind out uh, the principles in his own story and uh, share those with me. Wow, that's wonderful. So I, I was reading about this experience you had in 2004, where you were you were walking through to downtown Atlanta and you and, and you encountered a homeless woman uh, and. And that became a powerful kind of moment. T tell us about that. 
Yeah, so I was in my early 20s. Uh, this was around the time when I was starting to, I guess, form uh, the idea of, of, of servant leadership and really trying to figure out my way uh, and how I can insert myself and, and give back not only to the world, but uh, the community that surrounded me. And um, it wasn't easy. Uh, I remember that they, uh, my now wife, uh, we were engaged at the time. Uh, we were in college, uh, my wife Cecilia and I, and we were in our early 20s. Uh, we were sitting around the apartment um, with our gas tanks nearing the ESON, and we started to complain for a little bit, and then we caught ourselves, and then we started to ask ourselves, what could we do instead of complaining uh, to show up for those in the community that may have it worse off than us? And so we started to notice that we had a lot of excess uh, in terms of clothes uh, lying around the house. Um, and we uh, gather all of those extra items and we stuff them uh, in, in garbage bags. And we started our, our drive down to the heart of the city uh, here in Atlanta. And we, when we arrived, this is the first time we had ever gone out and just like engaged um, persons uh, living without an address. I remember pulling over to the side of the road and I put on my hazard lights. And I see this lady, she's walking down the street barefoot, literally no socks, no shoes. I jump out of the car, I run to the edge of the car near the trunk and I, I open the trunk and I, I yelled out, excuse me, ma'am, uh, do you know anybody who needs some clothes or shoes or something? Uh, this lady like uh, turns around um, runs towards the car, mind you, with no shoes or socks on, and looks at me and my wife, and she says, I need shoes. I was just praying for shoes last night. And so my wife at that point is like digging in the trash bags and trying to find the pair of shoes that she had placed in there. And it was this old pair of Reeboks to her, but when she pulled them out of the bag, they were like a brand new pair of shoes to the woman who was uh, barefoot. And coincidentally, uh, my wife's size were her size and she put on the shoes. I'll never forget the chills I felt or the chills we felt um, and the long conversation on the ride home, not even just talking about how we wanted to structure our family, uh, being intentional with our own children, but uh, we started to talk about what we wanted to give our lives to uh, in a rhythmic way uh, because you know, uh, events, service and events are cool, right? Um, but service isn't a, an, an event, it's a lifestyle. Mm. Uh, so we kind of uh, got our, like our, our core, a core of who we are and who we, we were being shaped to be uh, out of that experience. That's amazing. And in 2013, you actually formalized uh, the, the kind of the concept and Love Beyond Walls became a nonprofit. And then um, you actually made a decision to live as a homeless person, as a person without a home. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. So, um, I mean, fast forwarding, I was... Uh, I've been married to my wife for a number of years. Uh, I overcome a lot of um, the things that were stacked against me earlier in my life. At this point, I had obtained about four degrees. I'm currently working on a PhD. And um, I'll never forget, we always had this rhythm of going downtown and building uh, relationships with community members. And I'll never forget, I was building this relationship with this guy. His name was Kurt. Uh, he used to tell me to call him Kurt Dog. And so Kurt lived behind uh, this abandoned building. And it was kind of fit and stand, but it had a hole in the fence. And there was like tons of trash and, I mean, whatever you could imagine um, that would give you the uh, the anxiety of viruses or whatever it was being uh, in this space. I mean, that was just the setting in which he lived. Uh, used cardboards to lay down, um, donated clothes for a pillow, 
um, and whatever he could find to cover himself up. And it's in the middle of winter and I'm having breakfast with Kurt uh, for a three month uh, period. And around November, I got enough, like, um, I guess, confidence to ask him a little uh, deeper about his story. And Kurt, for the first time, had opened up to me. He hadn't opened up to a counselor or anybody else. And I think one of the reasons why is because I kept showing up because he thought, you know, at some point I was just going to stop showing up to have breakfast with him. Um, and he told me that he had lost his wife and his child in a car accident. Um, he could no longer function on his job, kind of blamed himself, uh, started to use alcohol as a way of coping, um, became depressed and ended up losing everything. And now he's on the backside of this building. Uh, when I saw Kurt, I didn't see someone as not being worthy. I saw someone as being highly deserving of having um, his dignity affirmed. And I, I wanted to show him that by the presence and the proximity that I was bringing to the relationship. And so I asked him, I said, Kurt, man, why don't you allow me to just use some of my contacts, my resources, I could get you into a nearby shelter. He quickly responds, he says, um, there's a shelter close by, 500 guys sleep in chairs. There's only one urinal uh, and the smell is so thick, you could probably taste it. He says, as a matter of fact, I probably wouldn't get any sleep um, in this shelter because I would stay up all night trying to uh, protect everything I own and possess in this one bag. And he says, um, why don't you do it? Mm. And I was, stopped, I was stopped in my tracks and I had to sit with that. And I sat with that on the ride home and I sat with it at the dinner table until my wife asked me a question and she says, what's wrong? You seem kind of off. And I say, um, I think Kurt challenged me today and I, I'm kind of sensing that I should like go through the experience of homelessness on the other side with a bunch of education where I'm more art articulate, where I could advocate more. I said, I, I'm, I'm probably supposed to make myself homeless at this point. And she says, what? I say, yeah, um, but long story short, uh, she agrees. Uh, we agree on a time period and I'll never forget, I was blogging about it and my wife and my two young children at the time are dropping me off underneath the bridge in the midst of uh, an encampment and I didn't take anything. And it was a few days before Christmas. And I had all the people, right, telling me, you're crazy. Um, why would you leave your family during Christmas? And, you know, it's cold. It's too cold out there. They were talking about how the, the temperature would drop below 10 degrees. And what they didn't realize is that I was trying to model to my kids that it's better to be a gift than receive one, right? Um, and it was just a perfect um, opportunity to display that action, not only for my children, but to show up for a community uh, that was invisible uh, to many people during this time. Wow. And so how, what was it like, like practically speaking for you to be on the street? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I did it on two separate occasions at, at a total of a, a little over a month, about a month and a half. Uh, I mean, being put out of shelters, um, you know, being in cold weather where, you know, some nights we would have to stand around a fire pit and literally throw donated clothes into the pit because there's no firewood. Um, I remember, you know, walking tons and tons of miles just to either use the restroom or try to charge my phone, uh, being put out of restaurants, uh, walking down the streets with some of my friends without an address and watching business professionals walk across the street to try to duck and dodge us. I remember one time uh, a person had bought everybody in the group a cup of coffee so we could sit inside of this restaurant because it was freezing cold outside. And, you know, this family that was sitting across from us didn't even know that I wasn't actually homeless at this time. I was just among my friends, um, but I was going through that experience. Family gets up, uh, gives us this like really, really, um, dehumanizing stare and walks away and moves to the other side of the restaurant. 
And so, <clears throat> you know, there were times when I would be on the corner even begging for dollars with one of my friends who had a terminal illness and it wasn't for drugs or alcohol, it was, it was because he needed medication, right? Um, and having all of the, you know, explicit slurs thrown out of the window. Um, we had people throw beer cans and cans at us and lock the doors and turn away and all of that stuff. And it was this very weird contrast because while I'm going through all of these experiences of being overlooked and pushed aside and it's like this community rallied together and they got me a tent and a blanket and whenever there was a meal that showed up they would be so willing to share I mean one night uh, I was sleeping and it was maybe 10 degrees with the wind chill uh, all the way all the way down to three degrees and it's raining and my toes and shoes are wet my toes feel like popsicles I can't even sleep and I come out of the tent and uh, my friend Tony is standing around the fire and I, I turn to him and I say, how do you make it when your, your toes are just freezing cold? Tony doesn't say anything. Uh, I, I call him a man of action. He just walks over to his tent, grabs a pair of socks, which were his last donated pair of socks, walks back over to me and hands them to me and say, you'll make it. Um, so it was this weird contrast of how you know, in many ways, there was this community that was being overlooked. Um, and there were so many different unique stories. Um, and me learning that homelessness is not monolithic. Um, and there are people who literally have nothing that would give everything. But then there are people that we would encounter that had access to everything that would give absolutely nothing. And it's just a powerful message. Wow. That's incredible. You mentioned something in here that, and that I think is amazing that, that we really need to look at these folks as people and not problems. And that yeah. is such a powerful sentence. Um, but talk about that because I'm sure the, as you were home, you know, kind of on the streets yourself, deciding to do that and then in all of your work over the last 15 years or whatever it's been you've you've gotten to know the people you know the the kurt and tony and these you know that, that you're talking about as people and not not prob not statistics not a problem to be solved but as a person to be loved i mean talk about talk about your experience and how that has impacted you yeah, I mean, I, I normally start with a rhetorical question where I ask, what if you were known for the worst moment or worst right. time in your life? You know, right. uh, if, if people were to sit um, and watch in the background and watch you struggle through, I mean, most of the times we get a chance to mask our problems or go through things uh, in a community. Um, which is highly contrasted to the experience of homelessness because uh, one of the greatest challenges is the lack of social capital. Um, you know, people are displaced from their families. Uh, people are uh, displaced from people who they can consider friends. Uh, I mean, even during COVID-19, uh, we were out in the, in the middle of a campaign. Uh, I mean, for a number of weeks, there were people in parks not even having access to hand uh, sanitizer or hand washing. Uh, there was little information disseminated amongst this group about what COVID-19 actually was. Um, and then we would encounter, you know, persons and, and they would say, you know, I miss my friends, uh, people who would commute back and forth. I have no one that, to talk to, you know, uh, so, even the, the whole term of the notion, you know, social distancing, right? I don't really like that term. I think we should reframe it. Uh, we, we've been physical distancing because people experiencing homelessness have been socially distant long before uh, a pandemic. And, you know, I think that is something to consider and something that we can all relate to because we all know what it means or feels like to be overlooked, to be passed by, to be unseen right? 
to not have something or part of ourselves that we want validated, validated. Maybe it's in your family, maybe it's on your job, maybe it's in your community, et cetera. Whatever that, the, uh, the anxiety or the, uh, the, 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 the void that you feel when this happens, imagine that in the context of homelessness and feeling that every single second. You know, like my friend Tyrus who would say, you know, pe many people fear us, but they don't know what the other side of fear does to my self-esteem. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, I'm somebody's son, I'm Tyrus. And when you fear me, uh, that actually does more damage to my worth and how I see myself. Um, that fear, yes, can be positive and it can, you know, help us to be aware of things that uh, we should be aware of to protect ourselves from hurt, harm, and, or danger. Uh, but in many ways, fear can also be a negative mm -hmm. uh, because the way that we see other people uh, uh, falsely can invoke a fear that can be also damaging to that same person. And it's important for us to, you know, see people, affirm people's inherent dignity, um, knowing that we can't give anybody dignity, we can only affirm it. And um, realizing that uh, this idea of home, if we take another definition of it, home is a place where you feel seen, accepted, you feel like you belong. And so far beyond a, a roof or four walls and far beyond the, the most beautiful edifice, uh, home is a place that we create in how we treat other people. Mm. What was your mentor's name again? Uh, Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's so counterintuitive. The idea I had, I because interestingly, I had, you know, somebody I look up to, a mentor, kind of a person in my life who, who told me one time, if you're getting, if you're low on money, go give something away. It's it, 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 like your experience with the, when you're sitting with Cecilia and, your, you know, your gas tank's nearing empty, but you're, but the, but you went to give some stuff away and it blossomed into this unbelievable work lifestyle. Um, it's so counterintuitive, but it's amazing. You know, I mean, you you feel like you're, you know, not doing well. So go give something away. So anyway, I, I think that's a powerful thing. Um, what is your vision Terrence, I know next time I see, I'm going to have to call you Dr. Terrence Lester, but it sounds like, but what, what's your vision here for, I mean, you, you've walked to the White House, you've, did, you've done COVID uh, sanitation stations with Lecrae, you've, you've got your hands in a lot of areas here, but what, what's the future best you can tell? Yeah, well, you know, our vision uh, for the organization is to create a world where no one is invisible. Um, as that is connected to the issue of homelessness, uh, we are trying to create more empathy around the subject, uh, educating people that uh, homelessness is not monolithic, that homelessness is much bigger than a few guys and gals that you may see on a street corner or underneath the bridge, that homelessness itself is a global issue. There are over 150 million people uh, in the world um, that don't have a place to stay. That's a lot of people. And I kind of oh. borrow or, you know, use the framework of ML King's uh, philosophy when he calls this a world house, you know, really having uh, this heart and posture to see the world as our address, right? Um, and so we want to do more work in, um, you know, decriminalizing what it means to, to live without an address uh, we want to continue to provide shelter, but most importantly, we're, we're trying to raise up more leaders uh, around the country and partner with more leaders uh, to equip them uh, with the necessary education and also ideas and, and tools uh, that is needed to show up in their communities. I mean, because when you think about it right now, uh, disparity is at an all-time high. Uh, but funding is, is low. Uh, you know, there's more work 
that we can, you know, actually give ourselves to, and volunteerism is low, right? Um, you know, there are so many people right now that are facing facing e evictions, and researchers are suggesting that by 2023, there'll be a 45 percent increase in in homelessness, right? Uh, based wow. upon what we've gone through with COVID-19. And so it's to, it's to stay consistent, but it's also to lock arms with other practitioners on the ground, people who we can collaborate with and build synergy to continue to build a more empathetic world. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, I think if people continue to, to feel invisible, it's only because we've forgotten that belonging is a critical aspect of our humanity. Yeah, so beautiful. What a wonderful, I could talk with you for an hour, but we're out of time, but this is powerful. Uh, congratulations, it's beautiful, it's inspiring. Mr. Moore is smiling somewhere, uh, but thank you for sharing it with us and for everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you, Dean. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. God bless you, man. God bless thanks. you. All right. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time.